Well, good morning. Welcome to Covenant Presbyterian Church. Those of you uh, gathered uh, here with us in the sanctuary, we even had to overflow up into the balcony. Good to see you all <laughs> up there. And then those gathered on the live stream, we're so glad that you're with us uh, this morning. We hope you're having a great uh, 4th of July holiday, a time to remember God's faithfulness to us as a country and especially our freedom to gather uh, for worship in the name of our God. It's good to be here this morning. The theme for our time of worship is twofold this morning. Remember, we're working our way through the farewell discourses as Jesus moves closer uh, to the cross. Jesus is preparing his disciples for the way the world will react in opposition and then how the disciples are to continue to bear witness to Jesus with the helper, of course, the Holy Spirit, who will be with and in them. So as we prepare for worship, may we remember God's sovereign care over us in times like this and really treasure times of worship in the sanctuary like we gather this morning. May the Holy Spirit descend upon this place this morning that we might worship in spirit and in truth. Will you please stand for the call to worship from Psalm 63. O oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you, my soul thirsts for you. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. Let's praise the Lord together this morning. was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy in life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you Christ, 
Pray together. Oh Lord, we, your creatures, behold your glory in the heavens and in the earth and all that dwells therein. We, your redeemed saints, see your glory fully displayed in the person and work of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. So we do sing, Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is my life. Father, we laud and magnify your majesty. We praise you and extol you for your infinite love. We bow before your throne in humble adoration. Be forever praised, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, bless forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our reading from the Psalms is various portions of Psalm 35. Hear the word of the Lord. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Malicious witnesses rise up. They ask me of things that I do not know. They repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft. But I, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother. As one who laments his mother, I bowed down in mourning. But at my stumbling, they rejoiced and gathered. They gathered together against me. Wretches whom I did not know tore at me without ceasing. Like profane mockers at a feast, they gnash at me with their teeth. How long, O Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. I will thank you in the great congregation. In the mighty throng, I will praise you. Let not those rejoice over me who are wrongfully my foes, and let not those wink the eye who hate me without cause. For they do not speak peace, but against those who are quiet in the land, they devise words of deceit. They open wide their mouths against me. They say, Aha! Aha, our eyes have seen it. You have seen, O Lord. Be not silent. O Lord, be not far from me. Awake and rouse yourself for my vindication, for my cause, my God and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad and say evermore, Great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servant. Then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we move to our time of confession, this text reminds us of the Lord's righteousness. And considering that, his righteousness, it reminds us of our unrighteousness. So we take time now to confess our sins, knowing that Indeed, Christ is our righteousness and that our sins will be forgiven in him. So let us confess our sin with the prayer printed there on page five. Together, almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have sought friendship with the world and have allowed our lives and our hearts to be shaped by our culture instead of your word. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But you, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our many sins. Strengthen us in our flesh to struggle against our flesh and the world and the devil. Renew us and remake us after image of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for his sake, that we may live a godly, righteous, and sober life, and the glory to all. Amen. And Father, now hear our individual prayers of confession.
Sing together. stand for the assurance of pardon from first John if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness the Almighty and merciful Lord grant you forgiveness of all your sins true repentance amendment of life and the grace and the consolation of his Holy Spirit amen what a wondrous love is this oh my soul oh my soul what a wondrous love is this oh my soul what wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul, to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down beneath God's righteous frown, Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. So Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. To God and to the Lamb I will sing, I will sing. To God and to the Lamb I will sing. To God and to the Lamb. Reading from the epistles is 1 John 5, 1 through 5. Hear the word of the Lord. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Well, friends, Christian life is a life of faith. It is faith in a gracious, giving God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, we are called in faith to steward the resources that God has given us. Um, so when we, as we come to a time of giving of first fruits, that's what we're called as a Christian to do. Um, you can still give online. You can still mail that in. If you are here today, there will be plates um, in the lobby um, as we exit. Um, but let's worship um, even through our giving. all the day when the long for Messiah would appear with the power to break the chains of sin and death and rise triumphant from the grave by faith the church was called to go in the power of the Spirit to the lost, to deliver captives and to preach good news in every corner of the earth. We will stand. faith this mountain shall be moved in the power of the gospel shall prevail for we know in christ all things are possible for all who call upon his name we will stand
Amen. Will you please stand? Let's greet one another in the peace of the Lord. The peace of the Lord be with you and also with you. Be seated. Encourage you to uh, continue to look into Covenant Chronicles that come out every week for announcements as well as the worship guide. I want to point you to page 16 of your worship guide. We have two primary announcements. Um, college Summer Fellowships every Tuesday evening from 5 to 7 at the home of Josh and Elizabeth Johnson. You see the address there in the announcement. They are discussing maintaining healthy relationships. So if you're a college student or the parent of a college student or know a college student, um, please come and participate um, on Tuesday evenings. And also you'll see that we have a fall Sunday school plan. Um, it is pretty detailed at this point. I wanna encourage you to read that. Um, but we've made the decision after Labor Day to gather on Sunday evenings. So we'll be having our Sunday school hour on Sunday evenings. They will be in two different groups, and so we will stagger those groups. But please read uh, the announcement there. Uh, please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions, but that is the plan as of now for our Sunday school classes uh, together again in the fall. Uh, now I'd like to invite Norman Pless to come and pray for us. Let's pray together. Um, Proverbs eighteen fourteen says this, the human spirit can endure in sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear. Father, we come to you at a time when our nation is seemingly torn apart by coronavirus and by racial unrest and by uh, just one thing and then another. But we do come to you uh, this morning realizing that you are the one who is at work in our country and you're the one that we come to in prayer this morning. That's why we pray, because we realize you uh, have something to say about and something to do about what's going on in our land now. So, first of all, Father, we thank you for our nation. We thank you for the opportunity we have to be alive today in this land, for the freedoms we enjoy, uh, imperfect as we are, Father, for a place that we can work together uh, and seek, uh, seek justice and seek righteousness within this nation. We have the freedom to worship, and we thank you so much for that. Um, Father, we've heard in the past two Sunday nights um, about the racial divide in our land. Show us how to respond individually and corporately. We pray for our brother Alton Hardy, who shared last Sunday night. Father, I pray and him and other he and other pastors in our in our city, ministering to the powerless and the marginalized in our midst. Father, give them encouragement and hope. We pray for our brother Cedric Moore, who's with Young Life, Ur Young Life Urban here in Birmingham, and for his uh, wife, Ann Elizabeth, and for their daughter, Selah Grace. Father, I just especially would pray for him. We would pray for encouragement and for hope. He, he, he mentioned to me that uh, his prayer is that he would do more weddings than funerals, and right now he's losing at a rate of three to one. Um, 
His first, no, his first wedding is in November, and we thank you so much for that. Again, remember this verse, the human spirit can endure sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear. Father, we pray that you'd be with Larry Neese, uh, Emily Lambert's father, uh, he, in his year-long fight with colon cancer. We pray that you would strengthen his spirit uh, in this sickness and that you would uh, give, them, give him good times with family and friends in these, in these days. Lord, we thank you so much for Victoria and, and for Marty. Uh, and for Victoria, we pray as she goes through these last two radiation treatments on Monday and Tuesday that you would be with her and encourage and strengthen her. We thank you that Marty's been released from the hospital after uh, a bit of an illness, and uh, we pray that you would guide him as he recovers. And Father, we thank you so much that Mary Graham Shepherd is back in town. We thank you so much that uh, you're at work there. We just pray that you'd give her and uh, Jennifer and the rest of the family refreshment. Father, we praise you for the birth of Francis Estelle Harrison. Thank you so much uh, that Re Rebecca and John have this new life in their midst. We pray that you would be at work in Francis. Father, um, COVID seems to have resurged. We pray for opportunities to love and care in the midst of this time. And Father, lastly, we pray so much for John as he comes and preaches. Father, we, we pray that you would speak through him and that we would hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Covenant Church, so good to see some actual human faces here in the sanctuary this morning. I'm trying to decide, are you the extra super holy people or just the extra extroverted people? Um, but it is nice to have a little bit of normalcy and to have things like this on a weekly basis that just give us some structure and um, pattern to our lives. Um, this has been a really unique season, obviously, for life and for ministry. One of the, I was talking to an elder earlier this week, and he was saying, you know, this, this, this isn't what you guys signed up for, you know? Uh, with youth ministry in particular, which is such a highly relational ministry, it's, you know, so much of it's on FaceTime or phone calls now, and it's just so different than what we had expected. And there's, you know, there's no way that anyone could have planned for ministry in a global pandemic. If there had been a class in seminary, I would have taken it, uh, but they didn't offer that class. And so many of us are left feeling very unprepared for all these things that are happening. And thankfully, there's a lot of things in ministry in life that you can be prepared for. And if you recall, we've said that this chunk of scripture, this chunk of John's gospel that we've been in for many months now, uh, is Jesus preparing his disciples uh, for his departure for his exodus, for the work that they're going to do after he leaves. Now, he spent a good chunk of the first part of his ministry sort of more externally, uh, preaching and teaching to the crowds, a more evangelistic ministry. And now he's retreated to a more discipleship-oriented ministry, and he's just spending a lot of intensive time with his disciples and he's prepared them for a number of things. He's prepared them for life together. He's prepared them for life in the church. And he's told them that they're to love one another as he will love them, that they're to lay down their lives for one another, that they're to give sacrificially for one another, and that the world will know them by their love for one another. He's also prepared them for the coming of the Holy Spirit, the helper, the comforter who would come and uh, bring truth and enable them to do the things he's called them to do. So this week, having prepared them for life together within the church, he's going to prepare them for life outside the walls of the church. He's going to prepare them for a life on mission. And it's important that we remember, as we go into this text, uh, the marching orders that Jesus will give his disciples just before he ascends, that he's commissioned them to go out into the world to make disciples of the nations, of the different ethnic groups, they're to baptize them into the local church, and they're to teach them to observe, to do everything that Jesus taught them. So they're supposed to go out there, and they're supposed to love and serve the world, just as they're called to love and serve one another. Uh, of course, the big difference there is that that love will not be reciprocated by the world. 
And when John uses this uh, word world, cosmos in Greek, it's important to remember what he means by that. He means the systems and structures and ideologies and philosophies, uh, the politics and the economics and all the things of the world that are actually arrayed uh, against God. They're actually resistant and oppose God and his kingdom. And so this is the world that they're called to go and love and serve. And Jesus knows that as they do this, they'll be rejected by the world. They will find the world hostile to them and to their message. He knows that they'll be rejected by the Jewish authorities, that they'll be kicked out of the synagogues, the center of Jewish life. He knows that they'll be persecuted by the Romans. He knows that they'll be thrown in jail. And he knows that all of them except John will be executed in pretty grisly ways for their faith. And he knows that, humanly speaking, in the face of this opposition, that they will be tempted to draw back. They'll be tempted to give up on the mission. That they'll even be tempted to deny Jesus, to abandon him and to apostatize. He knows it's going to be hard, and they need to be prepared for it. And our own context is actually not all that dissimilar from theirs. We also, as followers of Jesus, are called to be on this same mission of making disciples of the nations. And we also find ourselves in a context that is increasingly hostile to the gospel. We live in the same world, the same cosmos that they did. And increasingly, in a secular West, uh, we will find this to be more and more the case. We will find people to be hostile to the gospel, hostile to Christians, hostile to Christian ethics, and anyone who would put forth uh, the Bible or the claims of Jesus as true uh, and authoritative in any way will be increasingly seen as narrow-minded, as bigoted, as archaic, as repressed and repressive, will be seen as superstitious relics of a bygone era, standing on the wrong side of history and actually impeding progress. And I can think of numerous stories. I won't share any of them with you right now, but you've got the same internet that I do, so you can do the same Googling that I did. Uh, but there's any number of what are being called deconversion stories out there right now, some by even uh, semi-notable uh, former Christians. And the story usually goes something like this. There was some particular point of Christian doctrine or ethics that was no longer in line with what was found to be culturally acceptable. And so the person said, well, standing on the wrong side of history. We know the Bible says that, but I guess we've moved past that. You know, We don't live in those times anymore. And so it's okay to jettison this piece of doctrine or ethics that doesn't line up with the world. And... Assuredly, not too long after that happens, they've just chucked the whole faith. Uh, one, uh, one person who some of you would know uh, has recently said, because of this very thing, he's like, there's no uh, meaningful way that I can still call myself a Christian. I just can't. Uh, and it started with one little piece of doctrine that was disagreeable to the world. And so humanly speaking, we, we have the same weaknesses and the same propensities that the disciples did to give up on the mission or even reject Jesus altogether. And so as we come to our text this morning, we'll see that in light of this hostility towards the gospel, uh, Jesus will be preparing his disciples to remain faithful on their mission and there's two primary ways we're going to see that in our text today. First, we're going to see Jesus prepare them for their life on mission by helping them to understand the hostility that they're going to move into, by understanding the context of their mission. And secondly, we'll see Jesus prepare them by helping them to understand the power that he has actually given them to go forward on that mission, to be successful and faithful in what he's called them to do. And so we'll turn to our text now, John 15 starting in verse 18 through chapter 16, verse 4. I'll invite you to stand with me as we read that. 
This is God's word. And these are the words of Jesus. He says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you were not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted you, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And if they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that was written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the helper comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you remember that I told them to you. This is God's word. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for bearing witness to Jesus through your spirit and the scriptures. And as we open them this morning, we pray that you would open our hearts. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So the first thing we'll see this morning is that Jesus is preparing us for our mission by helping us to understand the context of that mission, the hostility that we'll experience. And we see that Christian mission is opposed because Christ was opposed. He says that the reason the world hates them is because it hated him first. And we remember that all throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, he was rejected, he was mocked, He was scorned by the very ones he came to save. He was especially challenged by the religious people, the self-righteous people. Uh, He was accused of drunkenness and gluttony because he ministered to sinners. He was accused of breaking the Sabbath because he used the Sabbath day to do good and not to do harm. And finally, he was accused of blasphemy for calling himself God's own son, thus making himself equal to God. And so he was falsely tried, he was tortured, and he was executed in the most painful and shameful way imaginable. They hated him. And he points in the text to two reasons specifically that they hated him. In verse 22 and 24, uh, he speaks of his words and his works that they especially rejected. In Jesus' words in his sermons, he often spoke about the deep brokenness, the deep sinfulness of humanity, that it wasn't just our words, our deeds, the things that we said and did that were the problem, but it was our hearts, that our hearts were filled with pollution, of sin. They were fountains of hypocrisy and self-righteousness. And he told the religious people who were really good at looking like they didn't have any sin, that they were like whitewashed tombs, that they were clean on the outside, but on the inside they were full of dead men's bones. He said they were like vipers. He said they were like their father, the devil, and that they were enslaved to sin from which they could not free themselves. Folks didn't like that too much. He also mentions his works, the deeds that he did. We've spent a lot of time in John's gospel going through the different signs that he did that reveal to them who he was, that he wasn't just a man, he was the God-man, the great I am. And they saw this, and instead of believing who he was, they said, you must be doing those things by the power of the devil. They rejected him, they rejected 
his works. And even if we don't think about his supernatural deeds, just think about the more ordinary deeds that Jesus did, what we might call his mercy ministry, the way he loved those around him, the way he cared for the untouchables of society, the way he cared for those who were deeply sick, who were ostracized, who were poor, who were sexually immoral. He even crossed racial and ethnic and religious barriers that were unheard of at the time. And I think something about Jesus' love for others, his selflessness, shined a light on the selfishness and self-centered of others, and they hated it. Earlier in his gospel, John has said that Jesus was the true light who came into the world. But people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were dark. And so the world hated Jesus. They hated him, and as he says, a servant is not greater than his master. They'll hate his followers too. He faced opposition, and so will we. Now, he also points out in verse 19 that the world will hate the disciples because they're, as he puts it, not of the world. Jesus has chosen them. He's elected them and taken them out of the world. And what he means by this is that the disciples of Jesus are not to be like everyone else. They're not to be like those around them. We're called to be a unique people, a peculiar people for God's own possession who proclaim his glories and excellencies and who by God's grace are growing to be more like Jesus in our words and our works, willing to call sin, sin, uh, and yet also willing to love sinners, to love and demonstrate selfless kindness towards those whom the world says are not worthy of kindness. And the world won't like that. We are, uh, as one has put it, resident aliens. We're still in this world, and yet we have a new kingdom. We have a new king. We have a new worldview. We have a new system of morality and ethics that so often stand in contrast and opposition to those of the world, and that will put us, at some point in time or another, at odds with practically everyone. Uh, And let me just make a specific illustration of how that works that I think is timely Uh, giving all of the sort of racial unrest and tension that is going on in our country right now. Uh, We think about the way Jesus loved people and what he thought about people. Uh, Jesus believed that all men came from one man, that we're all, in a sense, brothers and sisters, that we are image bearers of our God, that we are all worthy of love and respect. And we see all throughout the Old Testament, especially, that God hates injustice. He hates oppression. He hates when anyone is marginalized for any reason. He is a just God. And he labors for just societies and just systems and just human beings. And at the same time, we see that Jesus said we should submit to the rulers of this age. Peter said that we should submit to the emperor as supreme. And so we work within the systems of this world, broken as that may be. We don't seek to overthrow them. Uh, We actually obey our leaders right up until the point that they command us to sin against God. And so we have these two points of tension, it would seem like. And so often the way of Jesus is a way of nuance. It's a middle way. But when we walk that middle way, we're going to make people angry on both sides. We'll be opposed no matter where we go. And yet that's what we've been called to do. And lastly, you'll see here that Jesus points out that the reason they hate him and the reason they hate his followers is because they hated God. And ever since Genesis chapter 3 in the fall, humankind has been characterized by their hatred for God and their love for sin. And that's the world that we live in, and that is the world that we've been called to minister to and love. Now, it's important that we understand this context and this hostility for a number of reasons. Uh, Jesus didn't want his disciples to be surprised by what they encountered. We could see again how easily it might be to give up on the mission when you've faced so much tension for it, when you're being thrown in jail for it. 
We can see how easily it might be to deny what you believed under the threat of death. Uh, it could be easy to see yourself as a failure in the things that God has called you to do. But when those things happen, he wanted to make sure they knew they weren't failing, but rather they were being faithful. <clears throat> and that they could actually rejoice because they were being identified with their Savior. That they had been counted worthy to suffer for the name. Peter writes that we should rejoice and so far as we share in Christ's sufferings, that we can be glad and we can rejoice because we're being associated with our Savior. It's a good thing. It's a sign that they're actually doing what they've been called to do. And I remember experiencing this just in a small way many years ago. Uh, I was not a Christian up until I was about 24 and was pretty much uh, a pagan, a heathen, and... I was converted and sort of lost touch with many of the people that I had been friends with before. Uh, at some point during that period of time too, something happened called Facebook. And so eventually, a few years later, I, I was on Facebook and you know, Facebook mysteriously knows all the people that you know. It knows that you know them and it's like, hey, you know this person, you know this person. Um, it's kind of creepy, it's really creepy. Uh, Facebook is watching, sorry, tangent. Um, but so I, find, you know, I'm friending all these people on Facebook, and I'm looking through their pages, I'm looking through their pictures, and a lot of them have pictures uh, of me with them, you know, 10 years ago, and I was like, oh, this is so cool, you know, I'm sort of reliving some of these memories, but I noticed in one particular thread of these pictures, there was a lot of comments about me uh, having become a Christian and basically making fun of me for that, and... My initial gut reaction to that was to be really hurt. You know, these were people that I had loved and cared for. Uh, and I do think it's okay and it's a normal reaction when we face this kind of hatred or opposition to feel that way. But then I remembered this and I rejoiced that I was counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Uh, and so it helped me through that. And I think there's also a word of encouragement here too because Jesus says that many will reject them as they rejected him, but some will believe. Some believed in Jesus, and many will hear and will believe. The outcome is not up to us, it's just up to us to be faithful in what God has called us to do. And so I think as we consider this, we have to ask ourselves a few questions. We have to ask ourselves if we've ever experienced this kind of hostility or opposition for our Christian faith. And it seems to me like Jesus is saying on some level this should be normative for the Christian life. And so if we haven't ever experienced this, if we haven't ever experienced resistance for our faith, for what we believe about Jesus, what we believe about the world, then I think we have to ask ourselves, are we on Jesus' mission with him? Because there should be some things about us that are offensive to the world. Now, this doesn't mean that we are offensive. This doesn't give you a free pass to be a jerk to people. Uh, but the gospel itself is offensive in the world. And I think we also need to ask ourselves, where are the places where we might be prone to stumble? Where are the areas? What are the doctrines? What are the ethics that are unpalatable to the world that we might be prone to cave into? I think this is an especially important question to ask for you young people. You know, some of us older for folks, we're a little more curmudgeonly, we're set in our ways, we're not changing our mind about things. Uh, but you young folks, you live in a world of ideas and you're always asking yourself what is true and do I believe it? And so I would just encourage you to think about what some of those things are, points that you might be willing to give uh, and be honest about that and talk to somebody about it. Go grab Josh, grab me, or grab Dave, or Marty, or Sandy, and let's just talk through those things. Let us help you think about them. Let us help you be prepared for the world that you live in. So that's our first point. Jesus helps us to understand a little bit about the context of mission. And our second point we'll see in verse 26 and 27, uh, he helps them to understand the power for their mission that will actually enable them to remain faithful. And this is the Holy Spirit. 
the helper, the advocate, the counselor, the spirit of truth who will come to them from God, who will enable them to do what God has called them to do. And there's two facets of the Spirit's work here that I think are important for us to mention. One is the Spirit's witness to his disciples, and the second is the Spirit's witness through his disciples. So to the disciples and through them. Uh, The Holy Spirit, you'll remember, the second person of the Trinity, very God of very God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory with the Father and the Son who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who is the Lord and giver of life, who is to be worshiped and glorified, has come, will come to dwell in and with the disciples. He will unite them to Christ by faith, as Dave spoke on last week. And Jesus has already promised them that when this spirit comes, he will teach them all things and he will bring to remembrance the things that Jesus had spoken to them. So this isn't just a photographic memory. This is an infallible, inerrant, supernatural memory that he gives them. And this is, as a side note almost, why we have the Gospels, uh, perfect, supernaturally given witnesses to Christ, to his life and death and resurrection and ascension to his teachings. And you'll note that the scriptures point us to Jesus. The scriptures are radically Christocentric all throughout the Old and New Testament. They point us to Jesus. They bear witness to him. This is the Spirit's work. And the Spirit would comfort the disciples. He would empower them. He would drive them to an even deeper relationship with Jesus after Jesus' ascension than they had with him before because of their union and communion by the Spirit. And so when they faced persecution and opposition, the Spirit would be in them, bearing witness to them, reminding them, bringing home to them what was true. And this is why when Paul and Peter, as examples, sat in prison, they were able to sing hymns and worship even as they prepared to die. And the Holy Spirit does work similarly, although uh, in some importantly different ways today. The Spirit no longer is inspiring Scripture. There are no longer authoritative uh, prophets who speak, thus says the Lord today, as there was then. But the Spirit does still speak and bear witness through the Scriptures that He inspired. He illuminates them. He opens the eyes of our hearts and our minds so that we can know that they are true, so that we can know who Jesus is and what he's come to do. And everywhere the scriptures are read or rightly proclaimed, Jesus uh, is being borne witness to by the Spirit. The scriptures, you remember, the writer to Hebrews says are living and active. They're able to discern the thoughts and intentions of our heart. They're able to pierce us and drive us to Christ. They're able to convict us and comfort us. They're able to show us continually the deepness of our need, the darkness of our sin, and how greatly Christ has met that that need. And so when we are tempted to deny Christ, the Spirit will take these things of Jesus and bring them home to us. And I have every reason to believe that if any of us were ever put in a situation where we were Um, being forced to deny Jesus, those of us who are united to him by faith, the Spirit would enable us to overcome in those moments. He would remind us who we are in Christ, that we're beloved sons and daughters, and our Father in heaven is well pleased with us. So the Spirit is at work to us, in us, and then he also works through us. And these two things need to be seen as organically uh, related to one another. Think about it this way. The Spirit bears witness to us about Christ, and it's sort of like we're a reservoir filled with water, uh, and then that overflows into the lives of those around us. So the Spirit's witness to us then comes through us. And this word that Jesus used here uh, in the original Greek for witnesses, uh, martyreo, (coughs) and originally this is more of a legal term, Uh, It means to testify to something, to speak to the truth of something. So if you witnessed a crime, you would testify in court. And that's what the disciples are being called to do here. They're being called to testify to the truth 
of what they know about Jesus. These who have been with him from the beginning are called to share that with everyone else. They do this through the scriptures. They did this in their lifetimes through preaching and teaching. Now, none of us was there with them. We weren't there from the beginning. Uh, But each one of us who knows Jesus also has a testimony. We have a witness to give of the way that we have known Jesus and the things that he has done in our lives. And some of us, like mine, are a pretty radical conversion story about how Jesus turned my world upside down. While I was reading the Bible, I was overwhelmed with the notion that this, this is true. Uh, this is true truth. I was just overwhelmed with that. That was the Spirit's work in my life. But even if you haven't had that experience, God has been at work in your life. God has saved you from your sins. He's brought you into his family. Maybe many of you were born into good Christian homes. You're like, well, I don't really, you know, I don't remember a time that I didn't know Jesus. Well, that's the Spirit's work, right? That's your testimony that God saved you even from an early age. And God is sanctifying you. He's making you more like him. And God has given you deeds to do that you can testify through. You can serve those around you in a loving and self-sacrificial way. God has prepared good works before us that we should walk in them. And God has also given us a sphere of influence in which to share our testimony. In Acts 17, we see the apostle uh, Paul is preaching to the men of Athens, and he tells them uh, that God has made from one man every nation on the earth, and that he has determined their allotted boundaries and dwelling places so that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him. And what this means is that not only has God given us a testimony, but he's uniquely placed us in families, in schools, in jobs, in communities, in sporting teams, in peer groups, in churches, in cities. He's uniquely placed us there providentially so that we can bear witness. Wherever God has you in life right now, he's put you there to do this very thing. And prayerfully as you seek him, you will see those doors open by which you can bear witness to Jesus. Now, I also think it's very interesting that the Greek word here has come into English as the word we know as martyr, uh, which in contemporary usage means that you have died, you have been killed, you have been murdered for your faith. Again, remember, this just started out as a legal term that meant to tell the truth. But what happened over the early decades and centuries of Christianity, Christians were so often put in the situation in which they had to confess Jesus as Lord, as the God of the Old Testament, Jesus as Lord, not Caesar as Lord. They were so often put to death for their testimony that this word came to mean someone who's willing to confess Jesus unto death. And so to bear witness then is to be willing to not just die, but to live in such a way that Christ is the singular treasure of your life. To write, as Paul writes to the Philippians, to know that to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I do think, as I've thought about this, that even though we know the Bible says this, that we're commanded to bear witness Uh, Most of us will never do this just because God said so. We'll never do this until we're deeply convinced of his love for us, knowing that he first loved us, knowing that his steadfast love is greater than life. And the reason for that is you can't but help to talk about what you love, right? So you go to the sporting event on Saturday And whether it goes your way or not, you think about it all Saturday night and all day Sunday. And then by Monday morning at work, you just, you're bursting to talk about it with your friends, right? Analyze the plays, what went wrong, what didn't go wrong, what do we need to do next week, right? Can't believe the coach is getting paid that much money for this, those kind of conversations. Or the book that you read that you've just fallen in love with, you can't wait to share that with somebody. Or the new restaurant that you found or the new band that you've discovered, Those things just come out of us, right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so I think, again, it's a challenge to us if we find ourselves not engaged 
of Jesus' mission, not sharing who he is with other people and not participating in the deeds that he's called us to do, uh, how well we know and love Jesus. And I think that's very challenging. It was very challenging for me as I thought about that this week. And providentially, in my morning readings uh, today, I read Psalm 145, and I'll share that with you briefly. This is a Psalm of David, and he says this. He says, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. That's witness and mission. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. And that's the key thought there, I think, for that, is meditation is dwelling on and ruminating on and drinking deeply of who Jesus is. And if we struggle to love him as he has loved us, let's start there by spending some serious, thoughtful time on who Jesus is and what he's done and all that he has given us. Every good gift and every great gift is a gift from him. Every good thing in our lives is a gift from Jesus. Salvation is a gift from Jesus. Our sins have been forgiven. We've been invited into a new family, a new eternity. We have a treasure in heaven that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, that is being guarded there for us. We have everything if we have Jesus. We should be overwhelmed by that, and it should be the most natural thing in the world to tell our friends about that. And so my challenge to you and to myself is to spend some time this week, even today, just meditating on who Jesus is. Meditating on everything that he has done for you, everything that he has given for you, and the home that he has already prepared for you in the new heavens and the new earth. Soul, will you know your full salvation Rise over sin and fear and care. There's joy to find in every station, something still to do or bear. Think what spirit dwells within thee. Think what smiles of the fathers are thine. Think that Jesus died to win thee. Child of heaven, canst thou repine? Haste thee on from grace to glory, armed by faith and winged with prayer. Heaven's eternal days are before us, and God's own hand shall guide us there. Soon shall close our earthly mission, soon shall pass our pilgrim days. Hope shall change to glad fruition, faith to sight and prayer to praise. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for bearing witness to Jesus. We thank you for the work of your spirit. We thank you for the work of your son in whom we were chosen before the foundation of the world and who in the fullness of time was born under the law of a woman to redeem those who are under the curse of the law. Lord, we do ask that by the work of your spirit we would be overwhelmed by the person and work of Jesus, even today, even in this moment. And that out of the fullness of that love, we would share with others all that you've done for us in Christ Jesus. And now we pray the prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus, I my cross have taken. All to leave and follow thee. 
destitute, despised, forsaken, thou from hence my whole shall be. Perish every fond ambition, all I've sought or hoped or known. Yet how rich is my condition, God in heaven are still my own. Let the world despise and leave me. They have left my Savior too. Human hearts and looks deceive me. Thou art not like them untrue. Oh, while thou dost smile upon me, God of wisdom, love, and mind, foes may hate and friends disown me. Show thy face and all is bright. Man may trouble and distress me, twill but drive me to thy breast. Life with trials hard may press me, heaven will bring me sweeter rest. Oh, tis not in grief to harm me, while thy love is left to me. Were not in joy to charming, were that joy unmixed with thee. Go the earthly fame and treasure, come disaster, scorn, and pain. In thy service, pain is pleasure. With thy favor, loss is gain. I have called thee, Abba, Father. I have stayed my heart on thee. Storms may howl and clouds may gather. All must work for good to Brothers and sisters, go and bear witness. The Holy Spirit will be at work to you, and he will work through you. It might be tough, but the light momentary affliction of the things we suffer in this life are not even worthy of comparison with the eternal weight of glory. Now receive the Lord's blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.